Good evening and welcome back to another edition of Beyond the Backstage Pass. I am your host, Vince Edwards. You may know me from Sound Image Productions. And we got a couple closed Rody Facebook groups. I said that right here. You did. Thank you, bro. Nailed it. Yeah, I'm getting better at this. Killing yeah. it. So. <laughs> uh, one called Death by Loadout, another one called The Backstage Pass. Come check us out. Uh, with me tonight is my dear, dear, good, good friend and co-host, Kyle Thomas. How are you doing, brother? Great, man. Great to see you. It's great to see you. What a difference a couple weeks makes, huh? I mean, sure does. my Look at our pl- God, we've, place. Been, we've been cranking over here. <laughs> busy, busy. Every yeah. bay is, has a gig in it. It's amazing. It's been very nice. We, uh, I think we have six things we're doing this week. We've, done a, we've already done one or two, and we're getting into the weekend here, and, you know, just wonderful. It's great oh, to yeah. see the prep bays all filled up with gear, people run, boards up. We got training going on over here. We got it's really nice. It was nice to sit around the big table today. Everybody having lunch. Yeah. Finally, like the world started back up for us, Vinny. Yeah, we we're very, very, very lucky. Very, very lucky. I want to send a little shout out to the wonderful people that support us routinely, the loyalists. Uh, we, of course, the godfather of this show, Big Daddy himself, Charles Ricky, the one and only Pat O'Doul, the lovely Sue Kearney. She's usually with us tonight, but she's off on other business. Pat O'Doul, baby. We got you. I believe he's coming in when? He's coming in for Matt, uh, Mark J. Hedrick, right? I think Mark so. Mark asked if he would come, so we're going to collect him up That's and do right. that. That's right. i got to go Today pick you up. Today we John Del Rio in the building. He's checking in, and he came by to visit us in person. That was super fun. Right, he loved another gift. Met. John's big on the gifts. He's a very sweet guy. Just back from uh, uh, Hawaii, you know, uh, just a dear friend. And, and he's, of course, the proprietor of the, the cool-ass Facebook group, with, as well as my brother. I do a little help with it. Bob Powers. We always show the love of Bob Powers, the famous, you know, Metallica rigger. Uh, they created John's this page, the Loving gifts. Hands for Stage guy. Hands. Remember to just go over there. You want to get in some uh, good news and you know get your head in the right place it's a it's a sweet thing over on facebook what's yeah. up with you sir well i just want to say thank you to toby francis for the amazing <laughs> show last week i watched it i, I got to watch it later yeah but, what'd you think oh it was amazing i think it's, a, it's a new class act i mean toby dude was load of stories and it got yeah. pretty intimate in the middle of it and yeah. i thought yeah, you know stuff on his mind a little heart heart stroke right there you know yeah well, he's a sincere cat man he's done this for 45 years you know he's to get every mark on along the way he's worked with the biggest bands in the world and one and so nobody can contest that he's one of the most successful engineers in the world Absolutely. hey mikey i'm gonna take these and um uh, these are uh, uh, <laughs> and um and but he's got regrets you know, any one of us would be totally honest about this. Uh, we've made some decisions sometimes for the job that we could have been more careful with our families and our relationships. And Toby, I mean, the man said on this, this show, and we and him have talked about this in the past in person, but, but he had said that he wanted to talk about that subject and that he, he would have to reconsider if he was to do this job over because of some of the costs he had to pay with his family and relationships. That's a real part of this job. And you know, it's a part of this show, too, I feel like, and I think yeah. it helps guys like me, uh, or I got, at least in my opinion, yeah, I feel like right. it's it's like something that I haven't been able to weigh out in the past. And now that I have had like a full year to kind of assess it with the, you know, my, the, the love of, of my life and try to figure yeah. things out, it's like really weighing out what you need to do and the sacrifices you need to make. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're easier said than done. Or You're maybe the wrong. other way around. Well, the idea is hopefully you guys don't have the drugs in the mix. We had some crazy circumstances. We were naughty, and we did some bad things, and so it causes some selfish behavior and some, you know, rock and roll was a little more rock and rolly back yeah. in our day than it is corporate now, and so maybe it's a little cleaner ride. Um, and plus, the, you guys come in, you're a little sharper, you're a little more, uh, it's a slightly different group of people that, uh, can, you, you're very different than the roadies that I came up with. We were no, kind of thugs figure, and, bud, yeah. you know, naughty boys, and you're a smart guy, and, you know, you know trained in, uh, through the schooling system, so it's a, it's a little different, but it is good for you to keep an eye out. When we, when we were talking to the old dudes with the gray hair, man, there might be some wisdom in there from a lot of experience that you can learn from and avoid those people like yourself, you know, the Mikeys and the rest of the young folks out here could maybe avoid these behaviors and have a longer, better, happier career, happier life, happier relationships. Yeah, we made Absolutely. some mistakes. Absolutely. But what a treat. He is such a dear man. And, and, and you can't interview a guy that's 45 years in the business and do that in 50 minutes. You just can't. So he's coming back and we'll go we'll take another run at him. We never, the, the hour is never long, long enough. This can happen tonight too, I swear. Seriously. <laughs> So, yeah, while you guys are doing the amazing Toby Francis mm-hmm. show and, and all of his beautiful stories, I was tucked up in uh, Charles Krug Winery. Is that what was happening? 
What's that? We're at home eating bonbons. I wish. Feet up on the. But you know what? Bonbon. It's finally we're out of COVID mode. I was working. We put in a beautiful stage up at uh, Charles Krug Winery. It actually did turn out beautiful. That was extraordinary. Thank you, brother. Yeah, that was very pretty. Um, you know, and before that, we were uh, the the week bef- prior. We were me and Mikey were finishing up some Tony Tony Tone work. Yeah. We had them on the on the set, and they were really good killed that it was really amazing mm-hmm. uh, i just heard that i think from you a couple days ago that maybe jayhawk and john yeah. del rio yeah actually got some t-shirt or sweatshirt ideas together That's and right. we want to ask you guys you know who wants to get a sweatshirt from us who would pay for a sweatshirt so we can have zip a bunch of these zip up hoodies maybe printed. send us a little note that that would be something you'd be interested in we can get an idea and send sizes we can get an idea of how many we might want to order they're not cheap and uh, we can work something out. So, yeah. yeah. Jayhawk, uh, singer of the infirmities, Mr. Hat. Mr. The, Hat. The graphic designer. The man, the legend and himself. extraordinary punk rock singer, great band, uh, but really an incredible artist in his own right. Um, uh, it was me and him were talking about it. Turns out John and him were talking about it. So there's this triangulated thing. And so we're going to join forces and figure out the way to go. Some of his merchandise for his band is <laughs> cool as shit. Right? Yeah. I mean, he it's really nice. doesn't, he does it really, he really pays attention to detail and quality. And so, yeah, he's a good person to team up with us on, on yeah. this mission. But other than that, man, I'm so glad, like uh, what we are just were talking about, it's, it's busy, busy right now. We got six shows out. Love seeing everybody here. Finally, not stuck with just you and Mike. It's yeah. a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm playing. Getting tired of you guys. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just we understand. Kidding. <laughs> we understand. Don't, don't cry, Michael. Michael, <laughs> no, come on. Be nice. Mike, Jesus, he didn't mean I'm it. I'm sorry, Mike. He didn't mean I'm it, sorry. Mike. All right, all right. What else you got to talk about instead of being mean to Michael, I swear? That's it, brother. We're, we're staying busy. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. <laughs> we know you really love us, dude. So we love you. We're glad to have you home for right now. I, you got to go out over the weekend, right? You're going back out, do some yep. shows. Back and, out, stay <coughs> busy, man. Excuse me. We have. Uh, I think we got Los Lobos this weekend. Got a big thing down south, big thing up north. Uh, yeah, good problems to have. There's Amazing problems. Really to have. nice thing. Right? We hope that success is meeting all you guys and everything is coming your way. Uh, you know, if it's happening in Northern California, and we're rather uh, careful. Um, imagine it's picking up all over. We see some action on our pages that folks are, you know, going out doing things, and it's a good thing. Yeah, man, really definitely. nice. Thank you for being here. Thanks for all your help. Thank you, brother. Listen, I'm going to do this thing because uh, yeah, this is big. Get it? It's I'll get the deal. comments. Yeah, you got this. You can you talk handle to this. They missed you last week. They really did. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. Not guys. good at it. So <laughs> you did great. Thank you, my friend. All right, pal. All right, brother. Listen, guys, tonight, you know, we get we get lucky. We get some wonderful and interesting, incredible people on the show. Tonight is no exception. I'm going I'm to read it from a prepared thing. It helps me get it right. Tonight's guest has done it all. He's a British-born, California-based musician for the Seeds, bass player for the Seeds, uh, audio engineer, producer, music historian. Is it archivist? I didn't want, I know, I think I said, pronounced it wrong. I told you it was archivist. Archivalist. <laughs> no, no, it's archivist. <laughs> and music consultant at Ace Records. It's like God. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Tell me, welcome. Ali Palau. How are you, my friend? Well, I'm, well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, what, what, I, I have to do this. I'm sorry. I'll, Todd, thank you, sweetheart. Todd from My Heavy Memory brought a knife to the table. That was very kind of him. Uh, he was in last night. His band was in here playing rattling the walls, and he brought in this cool knife to add to the collection. I'm a, I'm a little worried, uh, Vince, with all no. this paraphernalia no. <laughs> on the desk. I mean, have I got to get the right answers? You got like knuckle dusters and handcuffs? And yeah, yeah, historically, that? that has been a thing, but I promise I'm going to be kind. And I know you all got right. this. Okay, yeah, this me. is not your first radio. You can get around, and I've, I've seen your stuff all over. And and no, you, you, this is nothing. No. Uh, yeah. So let me let me ask you. I know you get you you do a lot of stuff. You know, you you really cover a lot of bases. I've researched your stuff thoroughly. I've seen your band is played right here live. Extraordinary band. I mean, a band that's uh, uh, folks of our age that actually kick ass. I mean, you, the Seeds came out here and put it on a rock show, man. That was really impressive. Talk to well, me about your work with the thank Seeds. Thank you. Well, uh, the, you have to remember the Seeds are, are a, you know, a, a band that was formed back in the 1960s, and that's when they were mostly operational, had you know, several hits, including uh, Pushing Too Hard, yeah. uh, Mr. Farmer, Can't Seem to Make Your Mind, really. And they're one of those groups that kind of, like so many in that era, Vince, you know, they burnt brightly and then they tied disappeared and they were kind of forgotten about in the 70s sure. and the resurgent came through the sort of record collectors and the reissues and stuff like that 
uh, and they really kind of fitted right in with my sort of background, which was punk rock, you know, the English variety. Right. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, what I could hear in them, you know, I could relate to the energy I was hearing in the music of my youth. Uh, but it had that other whole kind of 60s zeitgeist and, of course, being from the West Coast of America and I'm a, a little guy in North London going like, wow, this is you know, so exotic and cool. Anyway, uh, cut a long story short, in my work as a reissue fellow, uh, I uh, worked on the Seas catalog, which had a, a great fun digging in the vaults and you know, putting their stuff under a microscope. I was involved with a documentary about them, Pushing Too Hard, directed by Neil Norman, which is uh, about to hit um, you know, streaming. Yeah. And, uh, and then you know, uh, the original keyboard player, who is the last surviving member, yeah. um, Daryl Hooper, oh, Darryl, yeah. decided he wanted one last go and he wanted that victory lap. And, uh, you know, I have actually been uh, the Viagra for quite a few, you know, uh, vintage bands. Brought a few things back uh, to life. You know, huh? uh, one group I played with for many years, uh, a legendary cult group from San Jose, the Chocolate Watch Band. I've mm. played, been playing with them for, you know, two or three times the length of time they were together in the 1960s. Uh, and great guys to play with, Dave and Gary and Tim. I love, love those guys. Um, and I got to know Daryl through doing the reissues, and he played with the Wash Band for a little bit, uh, sort of as a special guest. And then he decided, I want to put it, you know, it's my turn to do the seeds because the um, original singer, Sky Saxon, was an incredible yes, character, eccentric, absolutely. one of the great rock and roll eccentrics. He really was. You know, he'd gone out there in the 80s and the 90s and 2000s as the seeds. And because he's sort of the figurehead, you know, he. He, everybody associated uh, the name The Seeds with him and didn't realize that the other guys in the band, uh, Daryl and Jan Savage, the original guitarist, and Rick Andrews, the original drummer, they had as much to do with the making of the music. Sure. And so, anyway, like I say, kind of long story short, you know, Daryl uh, um, decided he wanted to put the band back together and, and do some shows just to kind of get that victory lap. And uh, he, um, he saw uh, me and my friend Paul Kopf the singer playing with our own band, Strangers in a Strange Land, mm -hmm. uh, and said, well, you know, you know, Paul especially, he can give good Sky. You know, yeah. he can do that. He can give good Jagger. He can do that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's how we kind of put it together. And it evolved organically where to Paul and I, who write together a lot for Strangers in a Strange Land, you know, had, there was the idea of do Seeds doing a record. So we wrote a couple of songs we thought would fit and recorded them and people seem to really enjoy it you know yeah. it's sort of in the spirit without being a pastiche or a parody sure. or whatever which is sure. you know so for me it's like it's wonderful to play with my childhood heroes the seeds but i, I don't want it to be a nostalgia thing or an oldies thing i want to be like a you know, put the same vintage. energy and juice into it yeah, yeah. that those records have you know the same fizz and spark and excitement well you know for those who haven't heard it again and and it wasn't i won't lie it was you know it's a little before me but so i hadn't been up on it i'd heard uh, a couple of the hit songs off right. of it and and then you folks came in and played and greg was i guess greg price one of our dear yeah. friends our mutual friend uh, was uh, uh directing and helping with it and mixing it and and I had a chance to watch it at length, and you guys are killing it. I mean, you know, very active. Uh, your singer's got a lot of presence. He really he really gives it all. You know, yeah, you know he's a f fantastic front man. He, yeah. he communicates the right energy yeah. for that music. Absolutely. Um, because it is a lot about uh, you know it's a, it's got to be authentic. It's got to be yeah. believable. Uh, and I've always felt that about playing music. It doesn't matter you know, who, who I've been playing with. I mean, uh, another project I did that's of a similar nature is I put a band together for Country Joe, McDonald. Well, I was going to ask uh, you about the Country Joe because I saw that you with Country Joe. And I, the kids did when I said, oh, you, you play with Country Joe. Yeah. I'm watching some of your work. And they thought, they didn't understand that that's a legitimate artist, a very successful legitimate mm -hmm. artist, and because they're young, they don't, didn't understand. And I knew immediately, well, you play with Country Joe, well, that's a, it, kind of a cool it, thing. It, well, they say, it, 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 there are, I mean, I'm of the generation where I missed it. You know, I wasn't there in the 60s, so I'm not like, it's not nostalgia for me. I would just hear it as I was growing up. Yeah. Like I say, in the punk era or whatever, and hear, you know, what, what's going on today is great, but that stuff from back then is really great. <laughs> really great, you know, yeah. And so, it's, you know, and I, the way I see music, and this kind of relates to what I do, you know, for a living, uh, is music is music. It doesn't matter when you hear it. It's... It's what it means to you at the moment you hear it. Sure. So, you know, I mean, a lot of, you know, I mean, 
you know, why are guys like, you know, Sabbath and Zeppelin still so popular? You know, I mean, you know, you know, we'd be wheeling them out on wheelchairs and right. people would still be filling the stadium. Yeah, that's right. It's because, you know, people discover that music every so often. That's really true. Um, and because that's what music is. It doesn't matter when it was made. It's how it makes you feel, you know. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's a, there is a tendency, especially in this country, to put older music, that, especially older music that wasn't successful, into a box like, you know, oh yeah, that's from back then and da da da. Yeah. And, you know, you pull it out and go, hey, remember this one? And then, you know, you put it back in a box and you go off and yeah. continue with your day. That's right. Um, for me and for a lot of Europeans, you know, the rest of the world is 24 7 for us. We love, we love the seas 24 7. It doesn't matter whether, you know, we, you know, they were playing on their AM radio when we first groped our future wife or whatever, you know. It's, uh, it's you know, what does it mean to us now? Gotcha. You know, and, and how exciting is it to us now? Uh, and I, I carry that mantra with me in whatever I do, any kind of music that I'm working on reissuing or doing back catalog. It's like, is, is this music important? Does it, is it historically important, but does it speak to you now? Does it, yeah. does it make you excited now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, I do worry that some of the young folks don't pursue, uh, uh, that it's not an intellectual curiosity to some of the older well, stuff. Well, I, I don't blame them here. because they've grown up in a, you know, a lot of younger people. They can get all that music instantly. Yeah. So they like it, but they don't have that emotional attachment to yeah, it that we do. Bad. You know, you know, they didn't have to go search for that 45 or that album or sure. yo know, queue for hours in the right. you know, line waiting That's to see right. the band or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, yeah, you know, times with big album liner notes, you know, getting it right on the needle. Just yeah. So yeah, there was a little more work to it, and uh, I don't know, there's a little more of a connection to it. You touched right. it, you felt it. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned that you and the Seeds were in here. You play bass for the Seeds. That we did a thing right in this very spot, and you can put it on a full-on rock show. We captured it, we collected it up. Um, well, you guys did a great job. It was uh, very kind. Greg Price, yes, uh, you know, uh, offered to do this thing, which is for a charity online festival in the UK. And um, so, you know, we obviously did it on a shoestring budget, um, but and our good friend Daniel uh, Swan uh, directed it, uh, yeah. the camera work, and did a fantastic job. Um, and we had a very pleasant experience at Sound Image, Haywood, California. Thank you, thank you. We were glad. It was pleasant for us, too. It was really great to have you guys in here. It was a treat to watch the band yeah. play and go through the, the process. You guys did set, or, you know, uh, wardrobe changes and kind of made it it was really clever well done well and you know since i mean british guys we go to dress up you know, <laughs> i wear the same damn thing every day um, <laughs> uh, um and you guys it really you put on a show you know the music was amazing but you also put on a show and so together and we captured and there was a lot of stuff well, going on and it, it really turned out thank well you. well you know what well, keep thinking we're in the entertainment business that's you right want to entertain people you know? that's right absolutely uh, well and I, I think we were you you guys in fact did that and we were able to capture it i was wondering if there was anywhere that uh, the folks that are listening right now i can go out and see that work uh well uh just so happens we booked uh, our first post-covid uh engagements uh up in but it's not unfortunate until november and it's up in the northwest in uh, Seattle. Oh, beautiful uh, place in November to play. At a festival up there. Mm -hmm. um, but we're hoping to really get out there next year uh, and do a lot of stuff. Well, go and check them out, guys. I can't say it enough. They put on a hell of a show. It's great music. It's a lot of fun. Uh, working with uh, Dean Rudlin on updating the, <laughs> to me, which, uh, so there's this, there's this place, I don't know, uh, Fame Studios. Muscle Shoals. Maybe mm -hmm. most people might know it by Muscle Shoals. Yeah. But, uh, and this is uh, Rick Hall's stuff. Now, Rick yes, Hall's right. a notorious, legendary guy. And this is Aretha Franklin, this is Eddie James. Wood, yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thousand takes to get one, one song right. Well, yeah, three days yeah, yeah. on uh, a three minute song. Uh, he's, he, but, you know, he was, they always called him the imperfect perfectionist. You know, that was his deal. Mm -hmm. And and he got a lot of stuff out of him. I know that you, uh, you updated their. Uh, some recordings from them and well, well I, fame fame studios um which was uh, you know this very very important place yes. in the history of not just american soul music but in that part of the world yeah Muscle Greg Souls, memphis is nashville sort of like a triangle of right. like you know, right. yes uh the sort of fount of soul and blues and and, and country yeah um but i had the wonderful uh, you know the the, uh, the the british record label that i do a lot of work for ace records yes um Tell roger me. armstrong the one of the directors he'd been knocking on rick hall's door for a long time you know wanting to access the masters you know that they had from back in the day uh -huh. and he finally managed to make a connection and so myself and dean uh went down there and uh, i probably made about half a dozen trips down to muscle shoals over the course of two or three years 
uh, and you know, and basically lived and breathed Fame Records music uh, that whole time. You know, the first time I actually drove out there with my recording gear because even though they're a studio and still a wonderful functioning studio, right. they weren't quite set up with an engineer or anything to be able to handle it. So I said, well, it's easy for me. Yeah. You know, I can bring my gear. That's what I do a lot is I'm like a sort of an Alan Lomax guy. I just yeah, sure. You're put traveling. a tape machine in the back of yeah. the car. That way I can go to people that say, well, I'm not letting my tapes out of my sight. Well, that's okay. I'll come to you. I got you. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he, uh, anyway, so fame, uh, you know, it was wonderful. And then got to spend a lot of time with Rick and really get the stories. And I mean, he was very funny because he, the first time we went to visit, you know, he was like, we went in and we started saying straight away, oh, all the stuff you've done out of James and Wilson Pickett and, you know, this yeah, and that. That's and my blah. favorite is, is Wilson yeah, Pickett. Right? Yeah, uh, and uh, he's, uh, you know, and he was, you know, he said, wow, you, you boys really know about this stuff. You know, but then, <laughs> but he's did the classic Southern businessman things that, wow, this talk about all the old day, old stuff is all well and good, but I got the hottest country rider in the day, give me a million dollars promo plan, and we'll talk about the old yeah, stuff. That's right, that's Rick Haller, right? <laughs> but anyway, of course, you know, yeah. we couldn't do that, but we did have a, uh, a good uh, a good connection with him. And then I went down there enough times uh, where I really, you know, started to really just be able to joke around with him. And he used to love taking us upstairs, his office at Fame Studios. Yeah. And, uh, and playing the latest demos by these country writers. Sure. And uh, you remember the old ad uh, uh, for Max L back in the 80s of the guy in the uh, chair back. and he's like blown yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Rick would play these things at ear-spitting volume. Yeah. He'd be like... <laughs> it's because he's deaf now. <laughs> and he'd be like, yeah, he had like yeah. a, you know, like a... Yeah, the big handlebar mustache. So like, yeah, that's like, right. Well, what do you think? He was yeah, like, oh, twisting well, his well, mustache like into this nightly whiplash. Well, he was a you know, wonderful man. And I'm so Absolutely. glad I got to spend time with him and to pay tribute to the legacy of what he did with, you know, with... Wilson, Otis Redding, and um, you know he, he did everyone from Otis Redding to the Osmonds to yeah. Paul Anker. To, yes. You know, uh, told me that you know Tom Jones even went down there and uh, caught the clap like uh, muscle no. shows. Well, I mean, it's Tom, it's Tom Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I love me some Tom, but yeah, Tom's been known to cross. And 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 of course, we, we really can't state this enough. Muscle Shows is an institution. It is a, yes. literally American treasure. And, yeah. and and it probably couldn't be what it was without the unique, precision-driven focus that was Rick Hall. Yeah. So and for you oh, to go he down was there, definitely and driven. Uh, and, man. Uh, and he had a funny thing because he had like not once, two, you know, twice he had he, he would gather the best players That's in the right. area. Oh they would be God. his team, yeah. and they would mutiny and go off. And, well, Jerry Wexler stole his first group, took yeah, him off right. to New York, Jerry, you know, then, with uh, the second, Franklin, yeah, and, and the second then, guys went and formed uh, the. Um, the uh, Muscle Shoals sound, yeah, that's right. you know, which became, you know, first, you know, because the Stones recorded there and a bunch of other people yep. became a little, you know, sort of overtook fame a little in the public perception. But fame is where it all started. Yes, that's you know, right. And fame is really the kind of the, the home of it all. It's and, the roots uh, of it. You know, if it wasn't yeah. for Rick's, like, you know, just stubbornness, you know. Yeah, and that's what know, he was. Yeah, but, yeah. And, 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 you know, in a way that got shit done. And, I, and Etta James commented on him yes, at, yeah. at length that she struggled with him a great deal. She was a very willful woman. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what a voice. She's just an incredible singer. And, yeah. uh, and she finally came to, f to realize, even though he was a pain in the ass, she was, he was usually right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and, and yeah. Clarence Carter and Candy Statton and all yeah. this. Yeah. And, of course, Aretha Franklin, you know, did um, oh, uh, I Never Loved a Man. And One that of her recent best uh, biopic about her, yeah. they had Rick so wrong in that. I oh, mean, it was, absolutely. Uh, that was not the kind of... You know, it's, these biopics always get it wrong. I mean, a, another a fellow that I've worked with, we may talk about him, Michelle Talmy. Oh, sure. You know, the guy who produced The Who and The Kinks. You know, he was represented in a biopic about uh, the Australian group, The Easy Beats, uh -huh. that he that he produced. And the way he was represented there was sort of like some guy with a cigar, like a gangster. Yeah, right. Like, so far from who he is, is this quiet guy that's not, you know, not They do this with Sam out. Phillips all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. A, Barry Gordy. There's a few right, that are yeah. kind of uh, Clarence Levant. You know, uh, yeah. that he really gets a hit knocked down. You know, uh, if, you, if you're strong at what you do and you right, push right. forward, uh, you're considered an ass opposed yeah, to yeah. A, a pioneer. And so we just, yeah, we we're very lucky. Uh, remixing now zombies. Zombies are this is the zombies. I oh, mean, yeah. Jesus Christ, what a seriously formidable, incredible, miles, uh, just extraordinary. And the large catalog, right? They were DECA. Uh, well, they, that, not so large that I couldn't... Uh, I put it all together in, in a uh, in a box set called Zombie Heaven, which you know, you know, the group have even acknowledged to me, kind of sort of helped re, re revitalize, if not their career, then at least the visibility of who they were as a group. Yeah, their uh, impact on music. Uh, but the great thing about a group like that, Vince, is that you know you could put every single note that they did yeah. in a box set, and there's I'd no filler. It, it, no. I mean, you know, the, the no, Colin no. Blunt song, the singer, he could sing the phone book. It would sound great. That's right. Rod Arge and Chris White, you know, incredible writers. 
inventive musicians, you know, like Hugh Grundy, one of the best drummers in, in, uh, in, in yes. British 60s rock. Um, but what was really nice about that whole project and getting to know them and working on that was they were enthusiastic about me being enthusiastic about them, yeah, that, which nice. is that That's doesn't nice. happen that often. Normally, sure. it's like get lost, kid. You know, don't bother me with this old stuff. Yeah, know? yeah. Well, uh, I think that you know you're, you because I'm still a kid to a lot of these guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you you love the music as well as you're you're you know very proficient, more than competent, and bringing together the technologies that helps bring their stuff back to life. And well, it does help to be able to be a musician and know the technical aspect of it because then they don't have to explain. Any of that stuff to me, and you know, it, then they can relax if they're trying. You know, because often I'm digging deep for like I really want to know how these things are put together. You know, because I want to know, but I also figure that like, I would want to read or learn about those same things if I was going and buying a package sure. of this sort of stuff. So I really, I really feel you have to look in the nuts and bolts, really look under every stone and everything. And that's why for what I do, um, you know, I'm, I'm unusual in the back catalog business. In that, you know, I'll come up with an idea. I will uh, figure out who owns the stuff, you know, work out a deal, uh, get a hold of the tapes, transfer them, edit them, mix them, prepare them, grill everybody that was involved that I can find, producer, musicians, blah, 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 mm -hmm. uh, you know, who made the tea on the session, whatever, to get that information, write the liner notes, choose the photos, supervise the you, artwork, you even write do the it all notes. from A to B. That way I That's can fantastic. have a complete yeah. control over it as far as my vision is concerned. I mean, occasionally, you know, other, I'd normally rely on other people to do the final mastering in most cases because you know you, you know you get so deep into something you know you need that uh, you know that sort of uh, objectivity but uh, and somebody else would design the art or whatever but I would supervise it but apart from that I can really sp speak with total you know confidence this is my project you know yeah, uh, yeah. good or bad I'm responsible for it you know um, absolutely uh, no and uh, I mean it's uh, that's a rare thing like you, you mentioned that right at the beginning there in your your statement that. That's not normally how that's done. Right. And so for you to, to come up with the deal all the way to you know, final completion of the, of the, the, the product, yeah, it's, extraordinary, it, uh, very rare. Again, I'm very fortunate. And yeah. I don't take the, the responsibilities lightly. Um, you know, but of course, you know, at the end of the day, you know, most people aren't gonna, you know, I mean, someone like you, Vince, you pay attention to the credits, you pay attention yes. to the background people. That's what your whole show is about. Yes, sir. But the, the average punter, you know, customer doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. they say, they say, you know, most people say to me, oh, you write liner notes, don't you, or whatever, blah, blah, they don't realize it. And I, I don't mind, as long as they're not saying, God, they're mastering on this sucks, or whatever. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's what idiot <laughs> compiled this? They missed off that 1972 B-side. Sure, you know, sure, blah, blah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're saying the right things. Um, one thing, you're a record collector. You have a, actually, I have something for you to look at before you leave. Somebody brought me in a batch of records. Brought my brother and I a batch of records in. And this is some this is some next level shit. Probably 60s, 50s, 60s, oh, 70s. Yeah? Some weird. You better be careful, Vince. I don't walk out with something. Well, uh, I'm actually going to let you look through it and take a few. Uh, uh, I think you. there might be some little gems in there. I was uh -huh. just so I just peeked at it. It made me uh -huh. top tenth of it. Uh -huh. And and I was like, whoa, whoa there's some wow. okay. interesting well, things in there. So maybe it's we'll something. Make a date. That's good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, I'm one of those guys. that's like, you know, you're, I'm not as bad as some friends of mine, but you know, when you go in a record store, it's like, you know, tingling. You know, it's like, you know, yeah, you don't no, know what you're find. I understand. But the funny thing is, if uh, most record collectors, are hardcore record collectors nowadays, they have to rely on eBay or Discogs or other that's places right. because. Sad. Because you can't find stuff out in the wild like you used to be able to. I know, sad. Um, but I have been fortunate that, you know, like such as with Fame, at Fame Studios, they've got a, a room, small room there, and it's filled with like 25 uh, count boxes of every single record that came out of there. Wow. That's so, you great. know, one day I said, hey, mind if I have a copy? <laughs> I yeah. walked out of there. Like, yeah, this oh, my like God. And well, these super rare soul records. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you're coming out of Fame <laughs> Studio, that must have been a hell but of a collection. A, that's the perk. You know, that's like a gratuity, a perk. Sure, you know sure, sure, I mean? sure. But well, being able to hang out with your heroes and go into these holy places and, and spend time with with uh, not just the materials that are there, but the people who created them, if they're still right, around. Right. And, and uh, some of the gear and yeah, that yeah. stuff oh, that yeah. permeates the I walls. I have a few bits and, of gear. I have yeah, the, uh, yeah. I have the um, uh, very, well, it was, it was a legendary studio, uh, legendary piece of equipment back in the 60s, uh, the, a one-inch 10-track wow. machine, you know, which one is a custom-made uh, thing that 
uh, there was a very famous uh, a DJ in Hollywood, uh, Art LeBeau, who had a record label called mm. Old Original Sound. Sure. Who, you know, they started, he started the whole Oldies But Goodies thing. He had those Oldies yeah. But Goodies albums. Uh, but he had a studio at his, uh, his, at his offices at uh, Sunset La Brea in Hollywood. And he hired this kind of a maverick sort of genius, this guy called Paul Buff, who was uh, prior to working for Art, had been doing stuff for Zappa out in uh, the Inland Empire, you know, yeah. Rancho Cucamonga. Yep. And he's one of these boffins who would, like build his own tape machines. So anyway, Art hired him and they built a, um, they built this machine. And it, for two or three years, it was like a secret in Hollywood. Hey, these guys got these, they got eight tracks, we've got two, tra two more tracks. Yeah. So a lot of people would go <laughs> uh, and record deal. there. And of course, when 16 track came in, it became like, you know, yeah. who cares? So anyway, long story short, I worked with, with the original sound catalog and got friendly with everybody. And when, they, when he sold the business a few years ago, I ended up with the, with the machine and uh, all the tapes that had been left there because nobody could take them to any other studio because nobody else had a 10-track machine. That's right. So there's, you know, Cat and Beefheart and Johnny Mitchell and wow. George and all that. And, this, you know, this is a tape machine that Incense and Peppermints was recorded on. That's amazing. All the Dyke and the Blazers. Yeah, I love uh, stuff like that. Stuff. That's wonderful. Uh, so, you know, I, it's great <laughs> to have a, you know, piece of music, music history. history right absolutely in, in, your, in your office you know. well, i couldn't agree more we have an ex-56 over here which is a jim gamble board it's serial number number six this thing is the history of rock and roll uh -huh. it's 30 feet over there and if it could talk it would say incredible thing and so i totally get right. that well, it's, uh, it's absolutely always, uh, get it's that. a uh, <clears throat> it's funny you just i don't know i mean it's it's not so much like collecting to i use the machine i mean what's great about it, it also has a one inch eight and a two inch 16 heads on it. So it's actually very useful for me in my work. Cool. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's still like, wow, you know, it's like that connection. It's like a vicarious sort of a thing. Um, I know. totally get it. I but, 100 but I, but I ended it. up with it just because I, you know, wow, you care about this more than we do. Take yeah, it. You know, that's very sweet. Yeah, and, you could, and you're actually putting it to use. That's, it's not some, you know, dusty piece in the yeah, corner. Oh, no, it's, it's tell used, stories it's about used. you yeah, put it to work. Yeah, and that's yeah. fantastic. That's really fantastic. You got about, what, 16,000 albums? Do you ever take with uh, albums of 45s? Yeah, something in that range. What's your favorite one? What is the one that's... Oh, that boy. Out? Well, go away from favorite. How about the one that is the most unique and rare? I don't know if I have anyone that's more unique than another, others. I mean, I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, acetates, you know, which are like one-off discs they used to cut back about in the day. Ten, they're good about 10 spins. Yeah, well, actually, they, <clears throat> as long as you play them with a light, light tracking cartridge and needle, you can probably get a bit more out of them. But um, Very, very sensitive, very rare. But they are, yeah, but th those are like one-off things. But, sure. but I have, you know, uh, um, I don't know, the ones that are the, the most special to me are... The ones that were like given to me by the people that made made the records, sure. you know. Yeah, um, I understand. You know, like for example, you, I don't know how familiar you are with big, the group Big Star, Alex Chilton. Big uh, Star. Big Star or yeah. Big well, Badass. Okay, well, I, wor I worked on. <laughs> That's a category. seminal band. Big Star. Yeah. If you don't know who Big Star is, you have to go see who Big Star is. It's like not knowing who MC5 or T Rex is. These, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, very influential group. Very I mean, influential. Didn't mean anything at the time, it, but That's music now. for musicians. Yeah, if you ask yeah, me. very much so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, I had a great fortune to work on their catalog and that's ardent studios in memphis which is like a fantastic place absolutely and it's very friendly with mm -hmm. the guy that started john fry who sadly has passed away i still miss him yeah uh but i remember like one day we were working on one of the projects and you know he, they have a still had a lathe there and he just like you know cut a cut a lathe like uh you know one of my favorite tracks and so, so i cut an acetate and gave it to him and signed it and everything that's amazing like, you know custom made like from <laughs> really the guy cool. who did it on yeah. the lathe where all the stuff was done you know so, wow. you know, so you know uh, so but of course that's priceless to me but to to somebody else you know they're like who cares you know it's just uh, you know so Sentimental you know, value. You know, I mean, I, I, I got Actually, this, it probably has some things, uh, you know, like pretty Beatles, interesting Butch monetary value. As, things, but, you know. I imagine that does have some interesting monetary value as well, yeah. but you're, that's not yeah, where but we... I don't, I don't think... Uh, I mean, you know, yeah. if, if you were to value my collection, like I say, you would... I, have a, I do have a lot of heavyweight items, psych one, psychedelic things and soul things. Um, but, you know, again, I don't have like, you know, the, you know, I don't have a God Save the Queen on A&M or, you know... Uh, the you know the, the classic sort of you know one of a kind sort of copy type things, but gotcha. Uh, it still sounds like a really amazing but, you know, collection. Yeah, you know, it's uh, but yeah, you know, record collecting for me is uh, you know borderline obsession, <laughs> as my wife would say. But at the same time, I I can use my collection as a library. You know, it's it's not just a collection. It's like you know I consult it. I use it's it so to you, check yeah. things. I'm working on a reissue. I can say okay, let's make let's check the original mono. 45 mix, let's see how different it is, that sort of thing, you know, so. 
I was digging around in your history, and I saw that you had gotten into the uh, the Rhino's Rhino's vault. I mean, that talk about a massive collection. Yeah, you, well, you, right, yeah, well, right, I, I mean, Rhino have a, they do own a lot of masters, but Rhino are principally, you know, the uh, have been, you know, maybe not so much nowadays because they're sort of absorbed by Warner Brothers. But sure. you know, from the late seventies on, they were like the the premier. United American reissue label. That's right. And uh, in the late 90s, I started like working on uh, projects uh, for them and uh, did um, these very these Garage Band collections, the Nuggets series, Nuggets One, Nuggets Two, Two yep. Nuggets, mm -hmm. which got a lot of uh, attention. And I've done quite a few other things. Uh, my first Grammy nomination was for a Rhino uh, box set, uh, "Love Is a Song We Sing." Which is a San Francisco, you know, Nuggets thing, you know, 1965 cool. to 970. Yeah. That was a lot of, uh, really a lot of fun to put together, and that was a great example of like I was left alone. I put it together. I, I got Prairie Prince, our mutual Prairie friend, Prairie Prince, to, absolutely, to do the cover. Wonderful guy, uh, great drummer. Uh, Hugh Brown did the design, um, and you know, I, you know, Ben Fong Torres, a couple other people wrote oh. bits, but more or less it was like what I wanted to do, uh, and so to get nominated for something that's completely you and not somebody looking over your shoulder saying, oh, do this or sure. blah, blah. You know, that means a lot, you know, from, you know, to get that from your peer, peer group. Absolutely. Um, no, it's an amazing so achievement. Ryan, Rhino, uh, really, there was a wonderful man that worked there, Gary Stewart, who, uh, bless his heart, he's no longer with us. Um, he really, uh, he brought me in and uh, I, I went to work with him uh, for iTunes and Apple after doing stuff with him at Rhino. And um, he really... Uh, Gave me a lot of opportunities, which I'll be forever thankful for. You know, so. Yeah, we're very lucky to have some of these relations of folks that have went away, but were extraordinarily right, right. formidable. Well, and, and I mean, everybody has mentors. You know, yes. uh, I mean, like you know, Roger at Ace is the same. You know, these are people that you know able to you know recognize that I could do things, but not like you know always be controlling it. You know, they say, go yeah. do it. You know, yeah, I, I, you know, I said, I'd like to do a zombies box set. Go do it. You know, yeah, but. that's, to me, that's kind of an amazing achievement. The zombies box set, yeah. it's extraordinary. Uh, you know, you've worked, you mentioned you worked with a lot of older uh, technology, older uh, yeah. uh, masters. Yes. And I, and that you, tend, you, you engineer them, you mix them down, you yeah. transform them. Yes. So how do you get, I've, I've heard your work. And some of this stuff is extraordinary. Some of the recordings you've captured are extraordinary. What are the secrets that you employ? First of all, are you taking this when you transfer over? You go into that yeah, tin well, channel. You transfer to Pro Tools. Analog, analog sources, mm -hmm. uh, mostly tape. Uh, and I've always, you know, the holy grail is always the master tape. Absolutely. You know, uh, you know. I mean, especially, you know, you you want to get. I mean, if you can get a session tape too, that's even, that's great. But of course, you know, you want to, to have the tape that created the record that became the iconic Absolutely. item. Absolutely, yeah, um, the closest you're going to get to I've, it. I've just been fortunate to have access to a lot of vaults where I could find those sorts of things. Um, and to also just be able to triangulate things and put things together and figure out where things were. Um, and, uh, you know, and then sometimes things just fell in my lap. Like, you know, some of my say I got a bunch of old tapes and they, I go pick them up and it's, you know, these things I've been looking for for decades, you know, and, yeah. they, you know, and they just say, oh, you can't, like, take it, great. Yeah, you know? When we talked last, did you tell me that something like that happened with you with the Who original? So, uh, the no, Who? it was with... Um, was it Kinks? Uh, 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 Shel Talmy, who uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, I'm very close with now, wonderful man who's, uh, uh, you know, tremendous pedigree. Uh, you know, he produced You Really Got Me, he produced uh, My Generation, he yeah. produced Friday on My Mind. And, uh, and you know, and then he produced Paul and I in our band, Strangers and Strangers, and recently, which is a, a, one of the greatest honors. Um, Wonderful. But and, you know, one day, uh, you know, he's uh, visually impaired. You know, uh, uh, his sight, eyesight isn't very good at all. Uh, so one day, I was with him uh, in LA and I said, "Hey, do you have any?" You know, I knew I always know to once I get comfortable with people, it's like, you know, "Hey, can I? You mind if see what your records are or what your tastes are?" Blah blah. Sure. He said, "Oh," and he said, oh, "I don't know. I might have some records here." And, his wife Jan came and said, "Well, there's some records here in the closet." So I started looking through, and it was, you know, just some not very exciting things he'd done in recent times. And I pulled out a blank acetate, and it just said David Jones on it. <laughs> um, you know, which tell the people who David Jones is. David Bowie. David Bowie. This, uh, <laughs> Shell produced uh, a couple of records by uh, Bowie in 1965. Wow. Anyway, on this disc was like five completely unknown. Bowie tracks wow. with a band from 965 and it's the 
grungiest, graunchiest Bowie you'll ever heard. No. Right here. Wow. And even the hardest core Bowie perverts don't know about this. No you shit. Know, this is, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, it's uh, just sitting there in a closet for X Crazy. amount of years, you know. Absolutely. But you, you've got to ask that question to be, get that access to find that thing. Uh, and that's where I've been fortunate. Well, Did you digitally archive it? I beg your pardon? Did you digitally archive it? Well, absolutely. What do you think? No, I just put it back. Oh, I don't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a little bit of gold you stumbled into. Uh, and, and we've talked about this before in our past inter, uh, interactions. But you, you, you do some interviewing and you're, in your research, and you, you get to run into some very special people. Yes. One of the ones that I found uh, extraordinarily interesting, something that piques my curiosity a great deal, uh, only had the, the luxury to work with him one time in the middle 80s, and he was, uh, it was, it was formidable at the time, but a little, you know, uh, it was not exactly in his prime, we could say. But it was the great Sly Stone, oh, yeah. uh, Sly and the Family Stone. Now, this is a band for me that, I'm getting the I'm getting the fuzz on the arms right now. I swear to Christ, damn! I mean, if I could, what, you, yeah, it, like this is a wow cat. Like this is a, a the guy that really, really hit the ground hard. What what, did, what was your experience with Slystone? Uh, one of the most pleasant and awe inspiring and you, yeah. you know humbling I think I've ever had. I mean, you know, uh, as everybody knows, he's. Uh, you know, he's had a, uh, an eccentric career since, yes. you know, his heyday of the late 60s and early 70s. That's right. Um, you know, a lot of things have happened, a lot of water under the bridge. At the time, I got to, I got to spend five days with him. Well, actually, I spent five days with him on one occasion, 2009, and then a few more days with him in, like, 2014. Uh, and this, both times, he was living in hotels uh, yeah. near LAX. That's right. Uh, and basically, you know, he was trying to get away from this manager that's had his fingers into him for so long, which is part of the cause of his, his Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, but he was, you know, because of that, he was, you know, cash poor. And in my travels, where well, we were just talking about finding tapes, you know, yes. I'd found some really great recordings of him from the Bay Area from around the time the Family Stone was starting. And, you know, really informative, you know, instructive stuff about how he got his his stuff together. Yeah, his, his music style together. is, yeah. Uh, so through some lucky connections I had, some friends of mine <laughs> that, that had a connection to him, I went down to the motel, checked in, and went up to, uh, you know, go talk to him that, the first night. And my knees were knocking. It was like, <laughs> like meeting Bob it, Dylan or something. Yeah, it's like, freaking you know. sliced on. Yeah, and yeah. he was totally personable. And, you know, I had money to give him for to license these tracks. Uh, but he, he didn't sign the, the uh, contract until... You know, five days later. I mean, he could have kicked me out. Just yeah. like, instead, every time I would go up to his room, we'd chat, blah, blah. You know, he'd be off doing things and blah, blah. He sent me off on some errands. I bought him a controller and a, uh, I bought him... Uh, uh, he, want, he said, yeah, I'm going to... You know, I need some new sweats, man. Can you get me some... You know, anybody who's around Sly is happy to do that for him. You know, Absolutely. happy to do an errand. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I go to the local Target there in El Segundo, it was like, you know, I don't know what the, what the hell do I buy for them. Yeah. So and then I saw there was on a, you know there was a rack there was a black and red uh, tracksuit, uh, fleece lined, and he said to me that he was going to go out to the desert like the Palmdale or something like that. So I said, okay, you probably like this. You yeah. Know, be warm. So I brought it back and he said, wow, man, red and black. How do you know my favorite colors? <laughs> yo, yo, Perfect. Blah, blah blah. You know, it's like uh, and. Um, you know, he put it on immediately. So I dressed like on. That's amazing. But I'd, I'd never laugh so much. He's a funny, sweet, oh, yeah. brilliant, you know, uh, guy. Just uh, really, I mean, and I got to see him make music, which is really pretty, you know. Um, like I would bring, I brought some of these recordings that I found and play them to him. And some of them he was sort of dismissed, but then others he got like, play that again, man. And then he'd start like figuring it out on the keyboard and adding little parts and all this kind wow. of stuff. And, you know, um, you know, really... Uh, I don't know. It's just and the, the, when I realized afterwards, this guy changed music. He didn't just change black music. He changed music no, it fully. Was, <clears throat> you know, to be able to spend some time, you know, one on one talking. And I was I talked to him about music. I didn't, you know, most people want to know about why didn't you show up or the drugs. Yeah, or yeah. Whatever, How'd you of, end up here? Uh, very, blah, you know, blah, blah. Almost kind of racist. Type How did you stuff just kind of like go away? A, yeah, they're putting him in like a stereotype of like in a box, know, yeah. super spade guy, freaked out on whatever. I always hated that. I always say, what about the music? The music is the most 
sensational thing about yeah. about Sly Stone. And what a band! I mean, everybody oh in that my band God, had their right. part. And, yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. uh, and they're all you know great people too. You know, it's um, to be to be able to you know help contribute to the understanding of his his craft and his music thing has always been a tremendous honor. Well, uh, for my money, it's one of the best bands there ever yeah, be on the planet. The, I mean, just extraordinary. Yeah, one of the last project I did of his stuff, it was a collection of a record label that he had called Stoneflower in the early 70s, where it was right when he was starting to use the, the drum machines, mm. you know, like he did on, you know, There's a Riot going on. That's right. Um, uh, I'm very proud to say that got nominated for a Grammy for uh, Best Album Notes. Wow. And I was all prepared, you know, because... You know, you know the, of course, when you go to the Grammys and you're, you know, yes, best album notes, not a very sexy category, but, you know, you're still like, well, if only it's a chance if I get it well, blah, blah. Of course, you know, when it's not you, you're just like, ugh. <laughs> but, but, you know, I had my whole speech prepared because I was going to say, this is the first time Sly Stone has won a Grammy or a Grammy. Which has is some criminal. To Let's guy, stop and think for a minute. That's criminal. Uh, it is criminal. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he got a lifetime achievement award or some other kind of recognition, but yeah. but he needs to. I mean, it's like sure. an actor or an actress that doesn't get an Oscar. Yeah. Yet is like you know, like Meryl Streep not yeah. getting an Oscar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it'd be kind of like that. Yeah, I yeah, think. yeah. yeah so it's, it's a, singular. It yeah, really so is. So uh, spending time with with Sly was really a that was a major highlight of my so-called career, I guess you would say. <laughs> I imagine. Of all the projects, and you've done so many, I mean, you really have spread yourself out. Uh, to, to look at your, your bio, it's it's crazy. I mean, and this is decade after decade. This is not something you're new to. Well, this is from the early 80s uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, um, yeah I, I feel like, uh, you know, I had to, you know, I was like, a, you know, I've been in, like you in bands since I was 18. Yeah. I used to be stupid. I used to say, you know, I used to have that whole Pete Townsend die before I get old. You know, I'm going to commit suicide at 25. <laughs> corpse, I don't right. want to be some old fogey. Yeah. Like, you know, like if I if I had gone to see me now when I was 18, I would have said, who the hell does that guy think he is? <laughs> some old gaffer, you know, You're all trying to play, up. pushing too hard or whatever. Uh, uh. But, um, but of course, you know, as time goes on, yeah. rock music gets older, and the people that grew up with it, like us, right. live it. You know, the, it's yeah. still appreciated. You know? That's right. Um, you know, when I was growing up, you know, rock music was only like you know twenty years old at that time. You know, that, well, fifteen years old maybe. That's a good so, point. So you know, it's. Sure. Uh, um, but, but you know, when I moved to this country in 1988, that's when he, you know, when I got here, and I like. I just wanted to know everything. You know, I'd already, you know, like most Brits and like some most Europeans, like most other people around the world, we'd hoovered up American culture. You know, music, movies, television, you know, I mean, it permeates everything around the world. Sure. And it's always this like, you know, America is this exotic land, you know, yeah. you know horn of plenty, all this other kind of, you yeah. know, it, really, you know, it, it, it is, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I'm driving down Route 66 in a pink Cadillac with leopard skin upholstery and a, <laughs> you know, a, a, a burger in one hand, a malt in the other, and yeah. a girl with a ponytail next to me and Chuck Berry on the radio. You know, uh, you know uh, and the well, dream. it wasn't quite like that when I got in. But, no, right. But, uh, you know, I, I, of course, San Francisco is where I glommed on to straight away because, yeah. you know, I've always loved the music of this area. And, uh, but yeah, I soon realized that the, the America does have this mentality of like, you know, yeah, what have you done lately? You know, do, what, we what, do you know, roll like that. What credentials? You, you don't have a Grammy, you don't have an Oscar, you, don't, you haven't had a hit record? Well, then you're unsuccessful. Don't count. Silly. And musician, the musicians I uh, meet talk to often that way. They're like, you know, why do you care about this crap from 50 years ago? You know? You know, it didn't sell. So what is, there's no market for it. I said, but you don't understand. That's the rest nice. of the world is not looking at that. We don't care whether it was number one or didn't sell, you know, 200 copies. That's right. Is it any good? Yeah. Does it speak to us? You know, and um, so anyway, I started looking under every stone I could. But I wanted to know everything. I was like the omnivore. I got to soak it all up. And I realized that you know this is America's popular cultural legacy. You know, was you know was getting thrown away or disregarded. Yeah, it's sad. You know, um, and it's taken a lot of you know. It's, unfortunately, I have to say it. The vast majority of, of American music, is, if it's been reissued, has been by overseas, you know, foreigners. Yeah, that's not true. Not by, you know, and I, I've even gotten a bit of that, if you believe it or not. It's like I've been told, you know, the people that other, you know, rival rivals or people are going off the same thing I on. Uh, so I don't want to, I don't want that foreigner getting that stuff. You know, yeah. you know, it's a, you know, the, you know, it's like well, I don't want an effing foreigner. It's like well, it's us effing foreigners 
that have, you know, saved a lot of your cultural legacy. Look at uh, Rodriguez in South Africa. Yeah. You know, yeah. extraordinary well, right. well, artist. Hey, look. Extraordinary. We, the, the, Lost the, to us. Yeah, but look, I mean, it's uh, Eric Clapton is the king of the blues or whatever. Yeah, it's right. like a white guy, yeah. uh, a English guy or whatever. Yeah. I mean, the fact is, is that yeah. it, um, <clears throat> Britain and, and Europe has made a good, uh, you know, we've sold American music back to Americans many times. <laughs> That's a good but way it's to because put it. we cared. You know, yeah. I mean, you're more likely to find a rare sun record in like Holland or Germany than you are in Memphis. You know, that's uh, probably you know, true. You know, yeah. it's a, that's probably true. But but that doesn't mean that, you know, it, what it means is that, you know, it's being preserved. It doesn't matter where it's being preserved. Uh, but it, it, it is a, a thing about America that it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, in some ways is, things are ephemeral when it comes to cultural we stuff, have a lot of it, yeah, um, you know. We have a lot of stuff coming at us, and it's uh, hard to sort through it. I, guess. I mean, it's getting better. You know, there are, yeah. you know, and I think you know, as time moves on, people are realizing that, you know, the, you know, the, the rock music really is art. Yes. What, whether you know, whether it be folk art or whatever you want to call it, uh, it's you know, it, it it has artistic legitimacy. Absolutely. Um, but it didn't for many years. You know? No, yeah. I I agree. It's kind of a shame. You worked uh, a lot with the great band, the Stingrays. Talk oh, to me that, about was, that. Uh, <laughs> that was uh, my first. Um, that was me and my school friends. You know, like, let's get a band together. You know, and yeah. of course, you know, your first band is always the one that, you know, you have the kind of, you know, you sort of have your teething troubles, but it's also you have that blood connection. Sure. You know, just through you know, sort of getting through it. And uh, you know, it was, we were a ramalama, punky. You know, we mac mashed it all, mash it all up. We love rockabilly. We love. You know, punk. You love you know surf it's music. It's some fun music. You know, yeah. it was just you know. We, but it was, to us, it's all just wild rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, and we, you know, we played it like we heard it. So we'd be like, wah, 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 wah. yeah. You know, so you know, some people like my nieces and nephews when they hear it now, they say that's just shouting. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's but, uh, just shouting. <laughs> but we, the funny thing about that group, Swing Rays, we were together for five years, but we still, still a lot of people. Uh, you know, I hear from all the time via Facebook and. I know that you know, I'm f still in touch with the other guys in the band, and they hear from a lot of other people about it. So it's nice that you know something you did when you were like a you know barely out of your teens is still speaking to people. Yeah. And that's that's an argument I often use with a lot of the musicians that I talk to. They're like this. I, I said, you know, your stuff, you know, speaks. You know, like the Zombies guys. You know, I mean, the fact that their music has touched so many people over the world, around the world. That's or, or right. Sly, it, you know, Sly said it makes him feel good to hear that people really care about his music. You know? Yeah. That he made people feel good. You know? Absolutely. No, got That's it. That's what music is. You know? If anybody deserves that reward, that payback for what he did right. for us, it's yeah, Sly yeah. Stone and folks like him. Absolutely. And, yeah, and we could do better at that as, you know, as a listening public. Uh, the Mushroom Jukebox Project. Now, Mushroom? he did a few of those, didn't he? Yeah, well, Mushroom was a... Um, <laughs> someone joked, someone joked about mushroom. I said, "That's like uh, you know, it's the kind of the kind of band that that you know, Alec went to see him. He would hate it. <laughs> it's like well, it was one of those, it's a jam, basically a jam band. Yeah. But but I mean, not jam as in like you know the fish yo know, hootie type thing. But yeah. in literally just like somebody starts a riff and everybody just follows along. You're more like kind of kraut rock or something like that. A bit more." minimalist and more kind of spiky and stuff like that and you know it's a lot of fun to play horrible to listen to <laughs> <laughs> i saw on one of the projects you had some elliot smith in it uh yeah he might have been on it uh, but it wasn't a session i was involved with unfortunately okay. well um, he was a special cat so yeah, i oh, saw yeah. that i thought wow yeah. reach around with elliot smith you know he went away too early and he, yeah he, well what, there's he, a lot, lot of guys like that that, that uh, you know so, yeah, yeah. it can be kind of sad that they way. burn burn out Boss, you know, but, yeah, well, you know, it's, the, it's somewhat the nature of the beast, but it's what I guess it's how it is. What are you currently involved in? Well, um, I always have projects going on. Um, I was just telling Kyle about my next project is one of the very first all women rock and roll groups, so called Goldie and the Gingerbreads, who uh, were led by uh, this uh, wonderful lady. Brassy Broad called Genya, Genya Raven, although she was called Goldie back then. And she you mixed one of my favorite records of all time. Which one? It's a uh, uh, Young, Young Loud and Snotty. Snotty. Oh, no Dead shit. Dead Boys. Dead Boys, really? man. She worked uh, at Dead Boys. Yeah, she produced Ronnie Spector, too, and she was yeah. she was quite a pioneer later on as a, as a woman producer. But she was, you know, in this group, uh, uh, they were from New York, but they were got uh, taken over to England by the animals. In fact, the Stones and the Animals both tried to take credit for having discovered them, and you know, and they just were, you know, they were like a really cooking, had organ and everything, 
uh, really cooking hip, like sort of a R and B, you know, you know, white chicks, but they had it down, you know, um, and um, uh, you know, very, you know, very, very important in the sort of in the kind of history trajectory of all women bands, you know. Um, You're you know, building but, uh, uh, and so set. to put their stuff together and tell their story, you know, again, is I, I love to put together releases that really have a. <laughs> put something tangible on something that's been in the air like oh yeah i mean i've said yeah we're the first all women rock and roll band but there's no hard evidence in terms of like a an anthology or something where they can people can read and listen and and hear you yeah know? and so that's a lot of fun to do and um uh and then shell uh tell me who i mentioned earlier done quite a lot of anthologies of his his catalog and uh they say he one day he said to me i'm bored you know any bands that want to be produced so i'm like uh, yeah. <laughs> so Paul and I, uh, you know, we uh, wrote a couple of songs, went down there. This is a stranger LA. in a strange land. Uh, yeah, strange. Yes, this is strangers in a strange land. Mm -hmm. Paul Cop for myself, and uh, we uh, went and recorded with Shell. We uh, used Clem uh, Burke from Blondie on drums. Wow. And, uh, uh, Jonathan Lay uh, played guitar, and uh, who used to play with Dave Davies. Uh -huh. And uh, we did some songs of our own, which are up there: uh, Broken Tambourine and uh, Poison Chalice. You can hear those uh, on YouTube. And then we also did a track with uh, Vince Maloney, who was the original guitarist uh, with the Bee Gees when they were like the 1941 mining disaster, yeah. you know, Massachusetts period. I enjoy that part of the Bee Gees. Oh, it's right. great. It's fantastic. Uh, there's, and there's, we, did a, we did a rare song. So overwritten, uh, underrated girl, band. Uh, and Vince put his uh, guitar on that, and that was a thrill. I mean, I love I love those sorts of situations where, yeah, you know, here I am, I go to like Vince Maloney and Shel Talmy and Clem Burke. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's rock and roll fantasy camp. That, that, that's very, very <laughs> special. You know, and I, just right now, since you said it's it just turned into a earworm, Massachusetts, because that is such a great tune, you know. Yeah. Just one of the... I, I just did coincidentally watch the Bee Gees documentary because I, I yeah. grew up with them and yeah, just an extraordinary band. band. You know, extraordinary. They're, they're, it's a strange story. I mean, you yeah, know, there's a lot they of had uh, some issues. In it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, boy, I mean, uh, singers and writers, you know, uh, yeah. they had it right from the start. So, yeah, you know. yeah, and they had a couple lives, but I enjoyed their I enjoyed their whole catalog. But yeah, I mean, but you know, their early it, stuff when, really you look at it from sticks the point for of it, me. I mean, one thing, Vince, I've always been into his songs. Yes. And it doesn't matter if it's, if it's metal Excellent. or, or hip-hop or yeah. disco or whatever yeah. format it is. If it's a great song, it's a great song. You can't right. take that away from a song. So, you know, it's... Uh, Couldn't agree with you more. You know, it's really... Uh, um, that's what I, you know, attracts me very much to a lot of artists is their songwriting ability. And they, they used to kick butt. I mean, what an oh, extraordinary yeah. band, extraordinary... So we can, the audience, if they, they really need to hear the seeds. They, you guys got to see this band. It's an extraordinary band. It's a lot of fun. That's the, you know. Well, um, well folks can go on YouTube and see the clips that we filmed here uh, under the titles uh, Butterfly Child and Trip Maker. Um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, we uh, hope to, as soon as everything starts opening up, I mean, it's kind of, I'm sure you guys know as well as anyone that it's, it's slow, but it's starting now. Uh, and you know shows are being booked and that's uh, right you know I, th I still think a lot of people are nervous about you know having big affairs but uh um greg was telling me he's going back on the road to alice cooper that's correct uh, yeah whatever, alice you know, cooper and, and ace uh, freely so uh, i have to say watching greg you know i've been with greg when he's been mixing black sabbath and it's it's really interesting to hear you know to watch him and yeah get, get the the things and he was greg very kindly mixed one of the Strangers in a Strange Land songs. Oh, I think he great. did it down here. I know the. I'm pretty sure he probably did it right over it. in the lab over yeah, here. Yeah, it was yeah. a, a crazy bass player on that. <laughs> uh, he did a fantastic job. He gave us gave it the muscle that uh, that it really needed. So. Well, you know, he's got a very distinctive style, and you know, he's one of the few guys that will be wearing a you know a golf shirt while mixing Ozzy and uh, yeah. and make it work and really. Well, he, he just uh, I mean, he's come to mix. Uh, a strange, he came to mix Strangers in a Strange Land live and just did a, a brilliant job he, he knows exactly how to make a band a live band sound good yeah, i mean just in terms right. of like where you know throwing the mics up how to i mean oh he's getting a, a, he's a technician when yeah. it comes to mic placement he don't yeah. mess around yeah he's no he's a, yeah, but, he's, but it's, he's, but it's he's a lot a of fun yeah. sitting with him you know screwing around with the mix he did for strangers because uh you know we um uh you know i, I have you know we might have different ideas but uh he definitely uh I mean, he listens, you know, which is a, you know, yeah, there's a, a lot of engineers don't listen, you know, you know, they just like react the highway. Yeah, you know? no, he gets and they the get news. offended if you say, well, you know, it's way too bright, you know, bring down some of the 5K or whatever. You know, yeah, so. yeah. Well, uh, I know that he's very amenable to outside input and, uh, he's, right. you know, 
is one of no, a kind we're lucky no, to have. Uh, the, as a, he was described described by someone recently, the limousine. Of, uh, <laughs> of, wow, I like that. Of, Did you hear that, Cal? Front, front of house that? guys. Greg Price is the limousine of front of house guys. Oh, I like that. That's kind of sweet, right? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, pretty yeah, bad. Yeah, we're very, all of us are very lucky <laughs> to, to be in his orbit, and uh, he's, he's one of a kind. Um, so they can look for you in November in Seattle for yeah. the Seeds yeah. live show, and you're doing, is it Goldie and the Gingerbreads? That's the next uh, release, yeah. Um, so keep an eye out for Goldie and the Gingerbreads. Yeah, on Ace Records, yeah. Um, Me and Vince want one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not handing out free records, man. I, I didn't say it was here. free. I, I will buy uh, it. Tell us where and when <laughs> will you take that out. Thank you really for, a lot for being here, my well, friend. Well, it's my pleasure, Vince. Thank you, Carl, too. And, it was a pleasure. Um, you know, thanks, it's, uh, thanks for doing this. It's great to hear paying attention to the, you know, the people that do all the heavy lifting, you know? Well, we couldn't do it without the guys like you, and uh, thank you for what, you know, keeping the old killer music alive. I, I, I love it. I, I live and breathe music. I know that you're uh, similar, and uh, you're doing we're, a special we're, thing. We're lifers. Yes, sir. Yeah, lifers. Yeah, we are. You're doing a special thing. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Cheers. Good night. What a fabulous event. <laughs> what the hell, man? You picked another lucky. nugget. Uh, I get really lucky. Really, it's so, so good. And we're gonna we're gonna do it again next week. Now, now next week I try to do this for you people because I know some strange cats, some really uh, interesting folks. Next week we're gonna have on the show, and I told him he can't come in here because he's dangerous. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're gonna have Pyro Pete Cappadocia on the show. Now, if you don't know who Pyro Pete Cappadocia is, Pyro Pete. I, I know him as the glorified arsonist. Pyro Pete is the guy who blows up the big shows. He is the pyro guy to the rock stars. When you see some of them blow up at a big show, let's say 50,000 plus, that's Pyro Pete. He's a psycho. He's an extraordinary cat. He is the best at what he does. He literally is the most sought after pyro guy in the business. He's fun, he's crazy, and he's done it all. He's going to come on the show. He's going to tell us stories about blowing shit up. We're going to make fun of him. We're going to have a good time. He's a sweetheart of a man. We're very lucky to have him in the, in the house. If you like what we're doing, we do it on YouTube, Facebook Live, and Twitch. Hit the like or subscribe buttons. Help us with those alg algorithms. Uh, check out our friends over at Signal to Noise Podcast. They're great guys, and they're doing a good thing. That's uh, Kyle Churnside, Michael Lawrence, and Chris Leonard, they have a great show. If you want to get into the ones and zeros, they're your people. We really appreciate you being here. You could have been in a thousand different places. You came out to be with us. We appreciate it very much. We're going to do it all again next Thursday at 7 p.m. We're getting real busy over here, so we're going to do our best to keep up with it. But uh, until further notice, we will see you next week. Until then, be good, be kind to each other, have a good night.